Hale, your career as a scholar and activist has spanned the arc of recent history in the Middle East and North African region. Before the Iranian Revolution 35 years ago, you served as the Secretary General of the Women's Organization in Iran, and you were witness to the unfolding revolution that swept Iran, and you have remarked that the reforms that followed the revolution could be defined as one step forward, two steps back. You have bemoaned some of the changes that have taken place, the ways in which women's rights and the progress that were made in the laws were rolled back post-revolution. And then, just five years ago, we witnessed another moment in history in the Middle East and North African region. And we are at the cusp of marking the five-year anniversary of the Arab revolutions that swept over the region. That were not, in your own words, gender-friendly. Can you speak about some of the parallels and some of the challenges, the opportunities, the missed opportunities for women in both the Iranian Revolution and in the Arab Revolution that we are about to mark next month? Um, Rangita, Iran had a revolution. You know, a revolution is very different than what we witnessed five years ago in a number of Arab countries. They were uprising. We call them revolution because uh, in countries like Tunisia and uh, Egypt and Yemen, uh, they managed to depose uh, their president. In Iran, when the revolution happened, it was an upheaval. It changed not only a regime, but it changed even the fabric of the society from a relatively secular country. Iran became a theocratic country. So that makes, I think, the big difference. Um, I don't think there are parallels between what happened in Iran when it comes to women's rights and in the other, in the countries of the Arab uprising. In Iran, one of the first acts of the revolutionary government was the suspension of the family protection law a law that regulated relations uh, in families, a law that the family, the pre-revolutionary family protection law had given the Iranian women the right to seek a divorce. They had raised the marriage, uh, the age of marriage for girls from 15 to 18. Um, women no longer necessarily needed the permission of their husbands to go to school or to go to work. Child custody was decided by the court and uh, they had uh, set up family courts who would look into these disputes. All that was suspended after the revolution and overnight Iranian women were faced with the reintroduction of polygamy, reintroduction of temporary marriage. We can discuss all these things later if you want. Um, women no longer had the right to go and seek a divorce. And the age of marriage for girls was reduced to nine, which is puberty, so in Islamic law. But in the, if you look at the Arab countries, except, you know, even in the countries that are now in a state of conflict, war, Iraq, Syria, and um, Libya, and uh, Yemen, 
you know, there was an effort to maintain the gain that women had made in the years before the Arab revolutions. There was one incident in Egypt where the constitution was drafted by the Islamists who came to power. They tried to really limit women's rights, but they did not succeed because they were deposed. That's a very interesting insight that you shared with us. And um, as you know, you were you and I were both involved uh, with the women's groups in Tunisia in the drafting of the Tunisian constitution. And what we saw was that for the first time in the Middle East, a constitution outlawed violence against women. And that was a breakthrough provision in constitution making. And that was because it was a participatory, process-driven constitutional making process. Women sat at the table and that was an important first step. Despite this breakthrough provision, what we see is that women continue to struggle to draft a domestic violence law. So while the supreme law of the land prohibits domestic violence, the women parliamentarians and women's groups are struggling to pass a domestic law. And what we see in Iran, too, is that there might be a law to be planned on family, pla to be drafted on family planning that might limit women's access to contraceptives. Can you speak a little bit about that and the ways in which sometimes even when uh, there are these major changes, change on the ground remains the same? Um, the case of family planning in Iran has been very interesting because immediately after the revolution, the revolutionary government encouraged Iranian families to have as many children as they wanted. Within a short period of time, the population almost doubled. The question of feeding this population, providing schools for the younger generation, providing employment for them became an issue. So then they started a campaign to, uh, for family planning and encouraged families not to have more than two children. And Iran was a case of success because within a decade, the family planning succeeded and the population growth came to 1.2. Now Iran is suddenly faced on the one hand with an aging population and secondly with a younger generation who necessarily does not want to get married and have families because of economic mm -hmm. reason and that's why two years ago the government decided to, they did not abolish the family planning law, but they cut completely, they cut the budget of the family planning organizations. Uh, so therefore, you have the family planning law still exists, but they don't have the, any money for it. So therefore, the clinics close down and so on. But in, there was a recent polling that uh, it hasn't changed, really. People continue to have very few children. So whether this is going to change, I don't know. But the concern is that eventually the aging population. So despite an authoritarian regime, what we see both in Iran and in other parts of the Middle East and North African region is a very vibrant burgeoning women's movement. And um, Iran too has borrowed a chapter from the Moroccan women's movement, where in 2004, because of years, in fact a decade of struggling to reform the Mudwana, the Moroccan family law, reforms that were progressive were brought in favor of women. And in Iran too, there was recently a, a million person signature campaign that was uh, 
introduced, although it hasn't still reached its fruition, um, that was led by women. So this million signature campaign has become a, a landmark, a hallmark in the Middle East and North African region, driven by women. Can you speak well, a little bit sure. about that? Sure. I mean, ir unfortunately, Iran's uh, million signature campaign was stillborn because uh, what the government uh, did, and the government is basically very scared of any kind of mobilization, especially when it comes from women, because the women in Iran have been the only group in the society who have stood up all along to the pressure that has been brought on them by the government, all the way from the dress code to the number of children they have, to try to uh, uh, stop them from having access to education, employment. So the Iranian women for 35 years really have fought at every step of the way the government. But when this uh, million signature campaign was announced, I think it truly frightened the government. So therefore, they started arresting whoever claimed leadership from that, for that movement. The first group were sent to prison, then the second group were sent to prison. And at this stage, as far as I know, and uh, they have really stopped the campaign. They are no longer going around collecting signature. But I must give you an anecdote. When I was um, in prison, my interrogators asked me about this million uh, signature campaign. And he said, you see, when I tell you that the West is trying to infiltrate in Iran, this is one way of infiltration, pushing women for equality under the law. I said, I think here you are making a big mistake. It's not the West. It's another Islamic country who set the model. And this was uh, uh, Morocco. So. so that leads me to my next question. And I was about to ask you more about this best-selling <laughs> memoir, My Prison, My Home, in which you with great insight and sensitivity and the kind of political astuteness that uh, really has made this such an important work. You look back on the 105 days that you spent in the notorious Avin prison, the pr a prison that historically has imprisoned prisoners of conscience in Iran. And um, what was remarkable about your release from the Avin prison was the ways in which women in Iran, in the Middle East, in the United States galvanized around your imprisonment and mobilized support, asking and calling governments around the world to um, to take action in calling for your release. So at so many levels, both at the political level and at the personal level, these women coming together has helped to mobilize change. Can you speak a little bit about that from your personal sure. experience? Sure. Look, when they put me in prison, because I had worked very closely with uh, women across the Middle East, a number of them, maybe a small group, got together via phone, Skype, email, and decided that they will form a free holiday uh, camp. They will start a free holiday campaign and uh, try and push for my release. So one of their tactics was to send hundreds and maybe thousands of email to the office of the supreme leader in Iran saying, you know, release Hale. She, she's a friend. She's an activist. She believes in women's rights. I don't think that would endear me with the supreme leader. But that was the approach they took, that she had helped 
other women. So in a way, we really an international civil society was formed by these women in the United States, in Europe, but especially in the Middle East, in Lebanon, in uh, Kuwait, in Syria. Then Syria was a country intact, you know, and Jordan. So all Iraq even, all these women I had worked with and I had met thought that this was really unfair what they did to me. But, um, you know, and that eventually I think it was their pressure and other international pressure that led to my release. But the problem, I think, Rangita, with authoritarian and theocratic regime in my region, in the MENA region, is that somehow the regime's approach to society does not go hand in hand with women's emancipation and women's rights. And I think the reason is that for these societies, empowering women is a threat. They believe that it is a threat to the family and to the role of men in that society. You know, except for two countries, Morocco and Tunisia, the constitution of every single country in the region says the man is the head of the household in the family. And that says it all, you know, except for Tunisia and Morocco, where the constitution says that the head of the family is shared between husband and wife. So you start from there, and then you take it down step by step, and you see why it is such an uphill battle for women in the region. And when women in the region think that they are reaching a point, then they end up in a state of conflict. You know, Iraqi women, before the fall of Saddam, had a relatively um, secular and also progressive family law. They were women serving in cabinet. They were women serving in parliament. So you felt women were rights. This has nothing to do whether how awful the regime is or not. But women managed to do some progress. Same thing in Egypt. Women were making some progress. Then after the uprising, you had an Islamic government, which was democratic elected. But rather than focusing on the economy, they were focusing on women's rights, trying to, after the criminalizing female genital mutilation, they were focusing on that to change that law. And, and this is what is happening everywhere in the Middle East. I think we need a fundamental change of culture. And women have been working on that. And I think eventually we will succeed. But it's going to take a lot of work. So as you have said, for women in the MENA region, it seems like it is one step forward, two steps back. And most of what happened post-revolution seems to have happened focusing on women's bodies, controlling of women's movement, women's agency. But there have been some changes. As you know, in the elections coming up in Saudi Arabia, for the first time in the local government elections, women will be able to vote and even run for office. So that's a breakthrough. In 2010, Jordan. City councils. Because yes, city, Saudi Arabia it's a local government. Have parliament yes. and local city government. Councils. Local government at the no. lowest level. You're right. Yeah. Um, in Jordan, the personal status law was revised in 2010, and that raised the age of marriage for women, allowed for no fault divorce. So there have been some incremental changes. Okay. But at the same time, as Zainab Bangura, the UN Special Representative for Sexual Violence in Conflict has said, 
Yazidi women are being sold in the market for a price less than the price of a pack of cigarettes. So we see that violence is pervasive from Egypt to Iraq where Egypt women are still being subjected to virginity testing and electric shocks to what's happening in Iraq. Um, violence and discrimination against women is pervasive. So given this context, what do you think is next for women in the women's movement, in mobilizing attention uh, with the international groups, whether it's with the United Nations or with the US? What is next for women in the Middle East? I th we can't generalize because Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya are countries in state of conflict and uh, even, even if the conflict is over it will take quite a while, maybe a decade for women to be able to start again where they had stopped mm -hmm. when the conflict started. But if you look at North Africa, it's very promising. Mm -hmm. North Africa, I mean, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. Algeria has the largest number of women in parliament. Oddly enough, one third of parliamentarian in Iraq are also women, mm -hmm. but, but they can't do anything. But Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia are going, I think, to become the trendsetter in the region for the time when conflict will end. But I think in Iran, I mean, I'm, I have total confidence in the power of women. The genie is out of the bottle. Iranian, the younger generation of Iranian women is connected to the rest of the world. Social media has helped, and there is no way that they will be pushed back in their homes and just relegated to second-class citizens. So I'm hopeful for Iran, I'm hopeful for Egypt, I'm hopeful for Jordan, I'm hopeful for Lebanon, but it's going to be at incremental steps. Am I pessimistic about the conflict regions? Yes, I am. The Yazidi women is just one example, just to, to give you. So I want to end this conversation with you, Hale, by asking you about the power of timing and the power of, you know, in every generation there comes a time when there is a turning point. And in my generation, that turning point was 20 years ago in 2004 during the Beijing World Conference when Secretary Clinton said mm -hmm. women's rights are human rights. And that was a moment that really galvanized the women of my generation to take action, to reform their laws, to use human rights conventions as standard setting uh, norms to guide those reforms. So to this new generation of women that's coming of age in the Middle East, would today be that turning point, you know, five years after the revolutions, just post part passage of the Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations? Do you think that this provides, this moment in time is a turning point for a new generation of women? Probably for the new generation in Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Algeria, maybe Egypt, but I don't think that currently women who are living in Syria or in refugee camps or in Iraq or in Yemen or in Libya even are aware of what is going on. You know, these women have to deal with the day-to-day -day difficulties that you, you are talking about women who are selling their daughters to get food for the family in refugee camps, you know. This is what you are talking about. You are talking about in Iraq about uh, this ISIS who is taking these nine-year-old, ten-year-old girls as bride and continuously rape them. This is, I don't think they are aware of them, but I think in 
countries in the Middle East who are stable, sure. And what has helped, I think, and empowered and encouraged some of these women are three women from the region has, have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Shirin Ebadi from Iran, then Tawakkul Karman from uh, Yemen, and also Malala, mm -hmm. you know. So that gives you encouragement. That is that you feel when you live in that part of the world, when you hear that, you know that you are not forgotten. And that is very important, you know. And I think they have, that is going to be the turning point for them. But for the countries who are undergoing this civil war and conflict, it will take a while. They need first stability and security and then focus on that. But what might help is that international uh, organizations and the UN should insist that whenever they are going to have these peace talks, we should have a presence of women. Not one woman as a token example, but 40 to 50 percent of women, because the experience of Rwanda and African countries have showed that, that if you have women at the peace table, you can achieve much more. Right, and I couldn't agree with you more. So far since the end of the Cold War to now, women have constituted just 2.7 percent of those who have been signatories to peace treaties. And only 6.7 percent of delegates to peace negotiations have been women. So yes, the situation is dire in terms of the numbers of women's participation. But apart from numbers, I think what you have said about recognition and validating the work of women like Shirin Ebadi and Malala have been important clarion calls, both mm -hmm. to the MENA region as well as to the world, to recognize that what is happening yeah. in the MENA region is tragic, but there are these women who are the redemptive force in the MENA region. So thank you very much for your you. uh, insights. And despite, I think, your words of caution, I think there is hope that uh, there is going to be change in the Middle East and that this change will be led by women. I thank hope you. so. <laughs>